Let me open us now in a word of prayer. Our Father God in heaven, each week we set aside this particular hour of our week so that we might set our focus on hearing from you. Lord, we thank you that you do communicate through your word. You communicate through the foolishness of preaching and for the, through the limited nature of your preachers. Lord, I pray that today I would speak better than myself, that I would preach truth with a heart of compassion and with a heart of joy. And Lord, I pray that you would arrest our attention. I pray, Lord, that you would cause our hearts to be inflamed with joy and with hope in Christ. And Lord, we acknowledge now our need. We acknowledge your love, and now we ask you to work. So Lord, especially as we consider what it looks like for us to be rejected when we share the gospel, I pray that we would look to the one who was rejected more than any other, who was despised and rejected of men, a man of whom men hid their faces. Lord, we pray that we would look to Christ, your son, and that in beholding him, we would become like him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would ask that you please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 25. <clears throat> As we've been making our way through the book of Acts, it has been our focus to learn from the apostles how to be witnesses for Christ. We've learned how to be sent and how to go and how to evangelize. We've learned how to share your testimony and how to defend the faith. We've learned how to be bold in the face of enemies and how to plant churches and many other things foundational to the Christian faith we have seen in the lives of these apostles, in particular Peter in the first third of the book and Paul in the next third. Well, the last third of the book shifts gears starting in chapter 21 and we move into Paul's extended period of integration. Even though Paul's normal pattern of missionary work and evangelism has now stopped, we're still watching God work through him and proclaim the gospel to those that wrongly imprisoned him. In particular, last week we saw three incorrect responses to the gospel that were on display in the life of Governor Felix. We saw information, information only Christians, they, they know the information but they don't really love or trust God. We saw procrastination. He was initially fearful of what he had been told about the coming judgment, yet he did not respond in faith. And finally, pretension. They pretended to be close, pretended to be near, just for the sake of personal gain. Those are all incorrect responses to the gospel. Well, this week we are going to see three more incorrect responses to the gospel on display, and we're going to see them in the Sanhedrin, in Festus, and in Agrippa. Now, just like last week, because this passage is very lengthy, we are going to walk through it slowly, and I'm going to provide running commentary. Now, before we dive in, let's first get our bearings by seeing where things ended up last week. If you have your Bible open to Acts chapter 25, do me a favor and just scroll your finger up an inch into the final verse of, verse, of chapter 24, and there you are going to hear this in verse 27. Luke writes, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Now, although Luke does not provide for us the reason why Felix is being replaced, history certainly does. He was very unfit to be governor. He served the office with a masterful level of incompetence. It's as if every single time he came to a fork in the road, he asked himself, which of these two options is most going to annoy the Jewish people? And then he chose that. This resulted in a widespread number of riots throughout the entire Judean region. And if you know anything about the Roman Empire, you know they hated riots. They prized their Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And the emperor demanded that all local officials, especially governors, would keep their people peaceful or the ruler would be replaced. Even though Felix was given his position because he was a friend of the governor, he had done immense damage, and he was replaced by somebody that was far more gracious and politically savvy, namely Festus. 
Now, we don't know a lot about Festus from the history books, except that he was often compared favorably to other Roman rulers. The, the Jewish people seem to recognize he's actually a pretty good politician. And we don't know a lot else about him, except for the fact that we know his parents didn't like him. How do we know that? Because they named him Festus. That's how we know that. Uh, if you're visiting with us and your name is Festus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry your parents didn't love you. Uh, but, but deep down, I know you agree with me. This is a terrible name. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Festus might have had a, ha a name that sounded like a swollen, pus-filled wound, but as you're going to see through his actions, he's actually a pretty skilled politician. Look at how he handles the Paul dilemma here in Acts chapter 25, starting at verse 1. It says, Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principled men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. Now, this is a really brilliant move on the part of Festus. You see, the Sanhedrin had become accustomed to pushing Felix around. They knew that if they, if they wanted to, they could force his hand, because if they began riots, it was going to ruin his job. So they knew that they could manipulate Felix into doing most of what they wanted. The reason that Paul was still languishing in prison is that they were, he was afraid of what the Jews would do if he was to release Paul. And the entire time that he was forced to be in prison, uh, Felix was continuing on in a process of mildly appeasing the Jews. Now, after Felix was forced to resign, it makes clear at the end of chapter 24, he left Paul there in prison because he was trying to do these same people that want Paul dead some kind of a favor. Now, Festus, the new governor, he has the opportunity to come in and be the exact same way and do the exact same things. He could have easily sought to curry favor with the Sanhedrin and these religious elites just by acquiescing to their request for this political prisoner. All he had to do is say, yeah, you know, I don't know anything about him. You can have him. And it would have made them much more happy with him. But notice that Festus doesn't refuse their request. He simply does what is right. He simply makes it clear, if this trial is going to take place, it's going to happen under my watchful eye and in accordance with Roman law. None of your shenanigans. So Felix invites the Sanhedrin to join him at Caesarea, where Paul is being held. Now before moving ahead, I want to say that I see the providence of God clearly on display here. God's providence is always working. It is always weaving together the threads of every act of creation to carry out his will. But there are some occasions when you can see what God is doing much more clearly than others. If Felix had remained in power, Paul would have remained in prison. The longer that man ruled, the longer Paul would be in chains. But the Lord allowed Paul to be there for two years. Then, when God determined it was time for Paul to move, God moved Felix. And then God uses that to move Paul. It's interesting because God caused Felix to fall out of favor with Nero, and God replaced him with a man that would move Paul out of prison and eventually on his way to Rome. Maybe you feel like you've been stuck in some kind of a circumstance. Maybe you feel like you've been stuck in something uncomfortable for a long time. Maybe you've been mistreated by someone. Maybe you've been carrying a heavy burden that you feel like you just can't bear any longer. Maybe you feel as though somebody's been taking advantage of you for many years. Maybe you're carrying a heavy burden that you feel like you just can't bear any longer. Well, God is never late. He wasn't late for Paul. He isn't late for you. He will work your situation in his timing. In the meantime, continue like Paul to be faithful to the Lord, to use this time in a way that will sharpen you and sanctify you. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you and bring you through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Let's continue along in Acts chapter 25. 
Look at verse 6 and following with me. It says, After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Here we have arrived at the first incorrect response to the gospel. That is persecution. Now, I don't know about you, but I am forgetful on occasion. Uh, you know how it goes. Life gets busy. Calendars get full. Children need attention. The car needs to be fixed. The garage needs to be cleaned. The work needs to be done. In my finite mind, my limited brain, it can only hold so much. So, I forget some things. For example, just recently, we put together the calendar for the spring and the summer, and I had Francesco send it out, and just a few minutes after it was sent, I received an email response graciously from Bob Walderman saying to me, I just saw you scheduled a meeting, a member's meeting on May 14th. That's Mother's Day. You sure? <laughs> That's a really friendly and gracious reminder from a former pastor. It's a way to point out a foundational rule of pastoral ministry, and that is that you do not schedule a business meeting on Mother's Day. <laughs> but I forgot that it was Mother's Day. Even though it shows up on the calendar the same weekend every year, I totally forgot that it even existed because people are forgetful. I am forgetful. Most of us will forget things. And if you look at this text, you should find it interesting that after two years of Paul languishing away in, Festi in Felix's prison, the fiery hatred of the Sanhedrin has not cooled off even slightly. Festus is just days into his job, and they have already devised a scheme to manipulate Paul into a dangerous position so that Sanhedrin can assassinate him. They have not forgotten, and they have not forgotten because their response to the gospel is one of vehement and violent opposition. Just like Paul had done 25 years earlier, they are now breathing out murderous threats. They were on a rampage against the gospel. <coughs> they would not stop until... Thank you. They would not stop until they saw the shimmering blood of Paul staining the ground. Verse 7 tells us that they made many and serious accusations against, against Paul, accusations that nobody could prove. Why don't we know what those accusations, or we don't know what those accusations might have been. All we do know is that they were not true. <clears throat> the enemies of the cross often seek to employ the strong hand of the government to serve against Christianity. They'll, not find, uh, they'll find any pretense that they can they look for any possible option to prosecute people who do not follow Jesus. Not all persecution comes through political machinations, especially in this country, but that is certainly not uncommon in the scope of Christian history. Those who hate the cross will try to get their governments to act against the cross. When you share the gospel, there will be people who hear it, and then they're going to make it their mission to destroy you. They will not rest until they can get you to feel some kind of pain. Maybe they will try to harm your relationships with others. Perhaps they will attempt to destroy your reputation through gossip and mockery. They may try to get you fired. Some people have a visceral response to the gospel that spurs them to maniacal hatred expressed in underhanded retaliation. That will happen. What if this happens to you when you share the gospel? Well, if it does, you need to know that you, therefore, are blessed. For Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't stop there. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All of the other Beatitudes are one-liners, all of them, until you get to this one. Only this one on persecution receives an additional 43 words. And that to me seems significant. When Jesus breaks the pattern, that seems significant. It's as if God is trying to hammer home this truth, knowing that those who are experiencing persecution need that extra affirmation. It truly is worth it. 1 Peter chapter 2, 4, verses 12 through 14 puts it this way. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. 
but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's the words of Peter who tells us that it is actually good when the Lord allows us to experience this. It's good for his kingdom to be advanced, and it's actually good for producing glory in us as his grace rests upon us. Brothers and sisters, don't fear the reaction of persecution, but don't be surprised by it either. Be faithful and proclaim the gospel, and the Lord's going to guide your steps. When Jesus was preparing his disciples for the inevitable future of persecution that they would face, he promised them in Matthew 10, 16 through 18, Behold, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts. They will flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Sadly, some people are going to respond to the gospel with a heart of hatred, and there are, there are going to be some who persecute God's messengers. But even in the face of those trials, God will help you, and God will give you direction, and God will hold you by his mighty right hand, and even give you, as it says here, the right words to speak. Let's keep moving now through the events of the trial that we see here in verse 8. It says that Paul argued in his defense. He said, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and I have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Now it's important to understand just a little bit of what the Roman <clears throat> judicial system was like in order to comprehend what just happened. You see, in our court system here in the United States, you have to wait till a verdict is reached before you can make an appeal to a higher court. Our system has local courts and district courts and circuit courts and the Supreme Court, and if you get a, an unfavorable verdict, one that you don't agree with, you can, in most cases, appeal to a higher court. Well, the Roman system was a little bit different. It had one local option, or the emperor. Literally any Roman citizen could bring an immediate end to any civil litigation just by saying the words, I appeal to Caesar. And this isn't always a good idea because emperors were often quick to hand out capital punishment to the people that appealed to them because they did not like to be bothered. They would give out the death penalty knowing that it would be an avoidance tactic so that they would not be constantly bombarded with requests for a hearing. And this was particularly risky during this time because Rome was currently being led by a raging psychopathic narcissist named Nero. Just to give one example of who this man was, uh, Nero's first wife was his stepsister named Octavia. While he was married to her, he impregnated his mistress named Sabina. Then he exiled his first wife, and he married his mistress. And then he conspired together with his mistress to assassinate his own mother. Then later, when their passions for each other had started to fade, Sabina started to nag Nero for spending too much time at the chariot races. So one day when he came home from the racetrack and his wife began to complain because she was near to the time that she was going to give birth to their child... In perfect alignment with his character, he kicked Sabina as hard as he could in her stomach in an effort to kill their unborn child. In doing so, he also killed his own wife. Now, in quick succession, if you're keeping track, that means that this psychopath killed his mother, his wife, and his daughter. That is the person that is going to eventually hear Paul's case. Let's keep it rolling. Verse 13. 
Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and other and a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss for how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you will hear him. Now, Festus was in a total, at a total loss for how to handle someone like Paul. He could not understand why the Jews were so angry with him. So when Agrippa, who was the puppet king over the Jews, who was handpicked by Rome to rule over them, showed up, Festus thought Agrippa might have a better understanding how to handle such an issue. Now, as a professional favor, maybe out of personal curiosity, Agrippa requested to hear Paul's case. Now, the man in these verses is King Agrippa II. <clears throat> he is the great-grandson of King Herod, the infamous king who sought to wipe out Jesus when he was just a baby by having all of the innocents of Bethlehem slaughtered. It was his great-uncle, Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist beheaded and who conspired with Pilate to kill Jesus. It was King Agrippa I who first beheaded the apostle James in Acts chapter 12. And now it is that man's son, King Agrippa II, who is going to step into the long line of family members who would stand before somebody, who would tell them the truth, who would preach the gospel, yet they would reject it. Now you're going to notice that Luke makes a point to repeatedly highlight something here about Agrippa. And that is that multiple times in the text, he highlights the fact that standing right next to him is a woman named Bernice. And that, that woman happens to be a sister of his. And there's a reason that this is highlighted, and that's because it was well known to everyone in the Roman Empire that Agrippa II and Bernice, his sister, carried out an on-again, off-again incestuous relationship for their entire lives. The Jewish people viewed this as an absolute abomination. And although Agrippa understood the Jewish people and their customs, he certainly did not identify as one of them or follow their religious laws. So much so that when Titus eventually brought an army to Jerusalem to wipe out the Jews, Agrippa doesn't fight with the Jews against Rome. He actually takes up arms and fights with the Romans against the Jews. And then he retires to Rome, and that is the man we are seeing now standing before Paul. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, it says, in verse 23. And they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the punishment and the prominent men of the city. And then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with you, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer, but I found that he had done nothing deserving of death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Now we can see in Festus' own words exactly why he so desperately wants help from Agrippa. He has nothing to say regarding the reason that he is sending this man to trial. He knows that Paul has been falsely accused, and he knows that he's been illegally detained for two years, and he knows that there are no legitimate claims that would hold up or even uh, be heard under scrutiny in Rome. So here's the problem. If he sends Paul to Rome without any accusations, it is going to be clear that Festus is either incompetent or that he is unjust. 
Neither would bode well for his political aspirations, so he is looking for anything that he can pin on Paul's chest to say, this is the reason the man is on trial before you. And Nero was just as quick to go after Roman officials as he was his own family members, so Festus is t walking on eggshells, tiptoeing around, trying to avoid the wrath of the emperor. Jump now down with me to chapter 26, and let's see how this plays out. It says, starting in verse 1, So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. He said, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul highlights the fact that Agrippa is fully capable of recognizing his innocence. He can't stand behind the excuse of ignorance and Jewish customs like Festus is doing. So Paul immediately flows into an extended defense. That is to say, Paul is going to take this opportunity to preach the gospel and to share his own testimony. Now, we're not going to cover all of what Paul has to say here today. In fact, we're going to skip his testimony entirely and focus on that next week. Uh, but what we do want to see is how it was received. Jump down to verse 24. <clears throat> it says, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Now, we have now arrived at the second incorrect response to the gospel that we'll find today, and that is accusation. When you share the gospel with some time, some, someone, sometimes their response is going to be to respond with accusations. Usually they will respond by calling you either ignorant or insane. Sometimes it's subtle, like eye rolls or mocking sighs. Sometimes it's abrasive and aggressive, sometimes inv involving name calling or references about the modest capacity of your brain cells. In my personal experience in this world, and in particular our community, uh, it's interesting how this always seems to pop up. It usually comes from those that feel like Christianity is the opposite of what Festus said today. He claimed that Paul had lost his mind because he studied too much. Most of the time in our culture, those who have been indoctrinated by their education are the quickest ones to fling around accusations of ignorance or even stupidity. Ironically, people who believe that their existence owe, is owed completely to an accidental explosion of superheated space goop that eventually cooled off and accidentally became a planet that was perfectly capable of hosting life, who also believe that even though nothing had ever been alive before, that general spark of life spawned itself into existence, also accidentally. And some of these people even believe that uh, that happened on this planet. Others believe it happened elsewhere to highly advanced beings, and then they seeded life onto our planet as aliens. Now, yes, people like Stephen Hawking, very powerful atheists in academia today, the majority of those who are running the institutions actually believe it's more likely that there were aliens that existed that put seeds of life on our planet than any other answer to how we got here. And they believe that through an impossibly perfect pro process of accidental progress, the, the genes of those single-cell orga organisms hit the cellular lottery, lottery billions and billions and billions of times in a row in order to transform into more advanced creatures and instead of following the rules of entropy that everything moves towards disorder. They believe that even though no creature ever knew what sight or vision was, they mystically or magically knew that it would make them more powerful creatures if they would develop eyes, so they went through a period of billions or at least tens of millions of generations where they would move in the direction of having eye sockets, a soft empty space on their face. And then over the generations, millions of them, that empty space that would make them better targets for those that are seeking to eat them would then magically have a line grow from their brain to the eye sockets. And the next generation, 10 million generations later, would grow a round ball that would be like a marble. And then 10 million generations later, that marble would turn into a visual eye. And then eventually they would be able to see. And they believe that all of these things happen by pure coincidence and pure accident, even though it goes completely against the entire doctrine of the, at the core of their religion, which is the survival of the fittest, that would make it impossible. And those vulnerable millions of tens of 
uh, millions of generations of sightless creatures would eventually grow sight, and then through random chance, they would eventually spark reason and imagination and language and art, and accidentally, of course. And these same people will acknowledge that it is only consistent to say that there is no intrinsic value in a person any more than there is in a garden snake or in a glow worm, because we are all part of the same process of evolution. And they believe, therefore, that there is no genuine purpose to life at all, and it's just all an accident. These people will hear you say you believe in God, and they will immediately say, you are insane. <laughs> they call you ignorant. They hear that you believe Jesus was raised from the dead, and their sides slip, split from overzealous laughter. So how do we respond to accusations like this? How do we seriously take somebody like this man who looks at Paul and mocks him and says, you're just crazy. Well, how do you respond when you share the gospel with someone and say, Jesus forgave my sins, and they say to you, you're just crazy, or you're just ignorant. You're just following the pattern of these, these people that are archaic and who are all dead. How do we respond? Well, notice the way that people often respond is to say something like, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, on the one hand, amen. I love that answer. Yes, we should stand firm on our faith. We should know, yes, God said it, so I do believe it, and I'm unshakable. I'm steadfast, unmovable. I know that God's word is true, therefore I can trust it. However, what people are often doing when they respond to others this way is that they're, they're basically refusing to refute the actual claims that their accusers are making. Notice how Paul responds. It says, but Paul said, verse 25, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about all of these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. Paul does not accept the accusation that he is crazy, and we should not either. We should respond exactly as he did by standing firm on facts and truth. Listen, science, history, archaeology, geology, they are all friends of the Christian. They all point to the creator. They all point to reality. They all point to exactly what we are saying. The claims that I was just listing above, those absurd things that those who have been indoctrinated by our system of this world have believed, those are not scientific claims. You cannot perform the scientific method on the claim that aliens ceded life to this planet or the claim that we evolved from single-cell organisms. There is no way to test that. Those are actually religious claims. They are claims that can only be adopted and held firm to by faith. Blind faith at that. Brothers and sisters, avoid willful ignorance. Show yourself a worker approved. Be ready to give an answer in season and out of season. When people respond to you with mockery, you don't always have to immediately provide all of the information that you know. You don't want to defend yourself. But it can be really helpful to show, I'm not afraid to give the answers to these questions. I'm not afraid to be uh, put before your so-called intelligentsia. I would be willing to speak to you about these things. And if I don't know the answer, I'll study it and we'll discuss it. And I'm confident that I'm right. When Festus began mocking Paul or acting like his claims of the resurrection and the appearance of Jesus were absurd, Paul grounded the conversation by stating in clear claims, look, what I'm saying is reasonable. Faith is not the same as reason, but faith in Christ is reasonable. When people respond to the gospel with accusations of insanity or ignorance, be prepared to stand on reasonable truth of the gospel. Now let's shift forward and see how Agrippa responds. Did you notice what Paul said a moment ago? He said, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped Agrippa's notice, for this has not been done in a corner. In particular, Agrippa's family members had been involved with the death of Christ. Surely Agrippa knew the claims that Jesus was alive. Paul pushes even further and appealed to the Jewish traditions that would have pervaded Agrippa's education, and he said, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. 
Now here, he's not saying, I know you believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. What he's saying is, I know you expect there to be a Messiah. I know that you believe the prophets were foretelling a coming Messiah. And I know you believe that. Well, listen, I'm telling you, Agrippa, he's here. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become as I am, except without these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Here we come to our final response to the gospel. It is the most dangerous and incredibly dangerous response to the gospel. The response is that of superiority. Consider the physical state of the people in the room. Back in chapter 25, verse 23, here's how it described Agrippa and Bernice. It said, so on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience hall with the military tri tribunes and the prominent men of the city. That word pomp is interesting. It's the word fantasia. Disney made that one popular for most of us. It means that they were putting on a great show. It means that they were dressed to the nines. It means that they probably had a small army of servants around them, waiting on them hand and foot. They had powerful officials following the, them around like lap dogs. And at the tribunal, Agrippa would have been seated in a place of prominence, surrounded by people who were fanning him with palms or giving him water or food at the slightest look of his eye. Standing in front of him was a man in chains, a man who was alone, a man in the middle of the room, a man wearing probably relatively worn out clothes. There stood Paul. There was nothing attractive about his position. There was nothing attractive about him as an individual. He was in a position that was quite opposite of pomp, the opposite of fantasia, the opposite of putting on a show. Next week, we're going to see the testimony of Paul, but you should know that if you read it out loud, his entire testimony takes about three minutes and 40 seconds, and that's for a normal paced reader, not one that reads super fast like myself. When I read, I know sometimes my sermons, I speak fast. King Agrippa heard. He listened to Paul. He was stunned that Paul was not trying to defend himself at all. Instead, he was trying to recruit Agrippa. Now, the tone is a little hard to see here in the English translation, but there, this is how it should sound. This is how the, the oomph of the text comes through. Here's how he would have said it. In a short time, would you, or maybe you could add the words, would somebody like you persuade me, someone like me, to be a Christian? This was a total dismissal of Paul. Agrippa didn't accept the message of freedom because he thought he was already free. He didn't accept the message of Christ the Messiah because he thought he was already the king of his own life. He didn't accept the message of repentance because he wanted to continue on in his sin. That is made very clear when it says in verse 30 that when he got up to leave, he takes Bernice with him. The reason that this heart of superiority is such a horrible response to the gospel is that it is at the root of all rejection of the gospel. Information, procrastination, pretension, persecution, accusation, all of these spring out of the same heart of self-superiority and pride. It's a heart of self-worship. It's a self-love and a love of sin that repels the message of dying to self and coming to the cross. Did you notice how Paul replied to Agrippa and everyone else in that room? He does so with genuine, heartfelt compassion. He says, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who are hearing me this day might become such as I am. Born again, bought by Christ, living for Jesus, doing whatever it takes to honor him. Except, I wouldn't wish these chains upon anyone. That is the heart that we should have for the lost. As the old saying goes, we're just beggars helping other beggars how to find bread. Next week, we're going to backtrack and see the right response to the gospel in Paul's testimony. 
But to close today, I simply want to preview it by reminding you that this passage is actually not about Paul. It's not about Felix. It's not about Festus. It's not about Agrippa. It's not about the Sanhedrin. It's not about Bernice. This is all about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. It's all about his worthiness. It's all about the fact that he truly is the Lord of all. He is the treasure of the universe. He is the one that is worth losing everything for. And he is the one who came to save sinners. The treasure came hunting for us. And we can be reconciled to him because he was raised for our justification. We can have Jesus as our friend because our God gave us Christ. He forgave us. He purchased us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive. By grace, you have been saved. Brothers and sisters, we have good reason to rejoice today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for so many in this room who have received it and believed it and are living it out. We thank you, Lord, that even when we share the gospel with those that don't know you, when people respond to it with these various forms of rejection that we've looked at for the last two weeks, we pray, Lord, that it would not in any way temper our zeal but that we would be constant and vigilant in our efforts to tell everyone, inform everyone about your Son. And Lord, I pray that our efforts of casting out the seed of the gospel, that in doing so it would find good soil, and that you would bring the increase, and that you would bring a harvest. We pray, Lord, that there would be many brought into your fold, perhaps, Lord, even today. We ask, Lord, that you would give us the opportunity to watch your hand at work bringing forth new creations, even in our midst. Father God, I pray for anyone in this room who is visiting with us today or who has been sitting in these seats for many years but has not yet bowed the knee to Jesus. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that you open their eyes and give them life. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.